All right. Um, so I had a uh, really long um, trip to Ecuador, um, but I wanted to get you guys a cross review for your EMT1 class. So those of you that can attend, um, welcome. Those of you that uh, are not present, hopefully you can watch this video. I sent an email out, but I don't know if it went uh, went through. So and we go EMT1 course review. It's going to be just a really quick, um, I mean, it might take a while, but I'm covering like 40 chapters in about 70 slides. So uh, it's not meant to teach you anything. It's supposed to just refresh you of all of the stuff that was compounded into your brain in that really short amount of time. So in your test, you will take your time and you guys do fine. Uh, objectives, we're going to cover some intro to EMS again, uh, medical, legal, some a &P, very basics, um, some cardiac, some respiratory trauma, uh, cover a little bit of the lifespan, uh, medical, and then testing tips and tricks. So intro to EMS. EMS started in a lot of warfare. Um, there's some like notable moments and people. Claire Barton was actually one that started the American Red Cross Ooh, during the um, Civil War. Uh, during World War II, there was some ambulance corps. These were run by the military. Uh, there was some advances that they used from wars that they've actually pushed into more civilian medicine. Many times uh, in the civilian area or in rural areas, they didn't have ambulances. They really just had hearses. We kind of covered that in class that a lot of times it was just taking a body. Mm. Ah, chain of EMS. So the the patient or a bystander is the the first one to to notify what's going on in the call. It always starts with a patient; otherwise, there wouldn't be a call if nobody's hurt um, or there was no reason to make a call. Then it would uh, end right there, and then it goes out to the emergency dispatchers, uh, a lot of them are trained now in uh, assisting CPR. Uh, they page out responders, whether it's fire, EMS, police, rescue personnel, all of the above. Uh, um, EMS arrives on location. They do their size up. They uh, start their, their treatment. They eventually start a transport. They transport typically to an emergency room and the emergency room will try to stabilize until they can get them to a specialty or allied health. So we're, lo we're looking at like radiology, maybe they need to go for a CT, maybe they need to go to um, psychiatric, they need to go to some physical therapy or they get dis discharged and they have to follow up with their primary physician later. Um, different levels of EMS. There's the national and then there's the Alaska. So emergency medical responder, which is EMR for national registry. We have, I am so sorry, the ETT, which is emergency trauma technician, which many of you actually started with your ETT first before taking this class. Um, then we have the emergency medical technician or the EMT. We have EMT ones, twos, and threes. They have the EMT, and then the advanced EMT. Their advanced EMT has the IV, the advanced airways, advanced medications, and cardiac. We actually break that down to two different levels, EMT2 being um, fluid resuscitation and meds, EMT3 having more of the cardiac. And then paramedic, here in Alaska, it's called mobile intensive care paramedic. Roles and responsibilities of a medical provider. Personal safety. Personal safety is number one priority. Um, if you get hurt, then the patient's not going to be cared for. You're going to take um, the resources that that patient needed. Um, safety of others. So safety of your partner, safety of the rest of the crew, 
safety of the bystanders, and then safety of the patient. The patient is already involved. Um, so really we need to make sure that nobody else becomes involved because again, we don't wanna take resources away from that patient. So it does sound uh, weird that we put the patient on the very last for the, the safety, but they're already involved. We don't wanna get any more people involved. So my priority is me, then my partner, the overall crew, um, any bystanders, the patient themselves. Um, we need to remember that our goal there is to do patient care, and that includes transport. So doing the best care that you can for that, that patient, that uh, incident that's happening, um, it's a responsibility to transfer the care, whether it's transferring it to if you're a first responder, you transfer it to the ambulance crew that arrives. Maybe you transport and you um, transfer care to the ER. And then the uh, patient advocacy. We need to do what is best for the patient. And sometimes that is um, telling somebody about um, like abuse. That, that definitely is. You, you tell... The authorities about child abuse because you're doing what's best for the patient. That's why we make, and it's sad that we have to make it mandatory. People should automatically talk about child abuse and tell people about it, but that's not always the case. We did have to make it a mandatory report. Um, same thing with elderly abuse. They are not able to speak up for themselves, so it's required that we stand up for their rights, um, stand up for their the best treatment. So patient advocacy, we need to do what's best for them. This goes into letting them know what you're doing, informing them. Um, your safety also includes before, during, and after the call. Um, you need to continue to maintain relationships. Um, it's a good way to decompress. It's a good way to express your needs and your feelings. Um, humans are social creatures. Some of them are so people are more introverted than others, more extroverted more so than others. Um, but we are a social creature. We don't want to just live in a cave by ourselves. There are some hermits, but even the hermits have some sort of relationship. Um, exercise, I'm guilty. I don't uh, want to exercise. Um, it's a good way to burn off some stress. There is such thing as too much. When you're completely stressed out and you are working yourself down to nothing because of guilt or anger, that is not a healthy outlet. Um, sleep and uh, like rest and relaxation, you need to be able to recharge the body. Um, eating habits, avoid drugs, alcohol, um, avoid caffeine because it does uh, change your sleep cycle. I love coffee. I love coffee. I can drink an entire pot of coffee by myself. I need to probably take care of that. Uh, but healthy eating habits is a good way to maintain. Um, just, I mean, when I, when I eat something super fatty, I feel like garbage. Like you eat garbage, you feel like garbage. Um, like it's delicious and it tastes good. But afterwards, I'm like, ugh, my stomach is like bloated and gross. So there is some mental well-being when you do eat healthier. You, you do feel better. Um, vaccines, medical evaluations. Every two years, I have to go in for my CDL and get medically evaluated. Um, for those that don't have those requirements, you should go in and get checked um, regularly because even if you... Um, don't feel symptoms, you could always catch something um, that you might not have caught until it's too late. So just getting a, getting a good well baby check, um, even in your adulthood, um, it could prevent all sorts of illnesses. And just because you say you don't have a medical history doesn't mean you don't have medical problems. It just means you haven't been seen by a doctor. Um, and then vaccines, hepatitis B will help you um, be less likely to get it. Uh, we've got a new vaccine for COVID. Um, it is brand new as of this, um, this month. So people are taking it right now. There's flu vaccine. Um, there's yellow fever, which is one I had to take to go to Ecuador. I had to get typhoid. 
which is when you had to get, um, there's Tdap. Um, TB testing is not a vaccine, but it is a, um, something you can do to make sure that you are keeping up on whether you've been exposed or not. It doesn't prevent um, tuberculosis, but that's, that's one of those that you should get with your medical evaluation. Um, scene safety is the most important concept in fire, EMS, rescue, your everyday life um, is, is just keep your head on a swivel, pay attention to things. When you're putting a ladder up, look at the ground you're putting your ladder on. Look above you um, so you don't hit a, a power line with your ladder. When you are walking on an icy surface here in Alaska, watch your footing. Um, driving your car, pay attention to the road. Don't, don't text, um, don't smoke a cigarette and eat a burger at the same time. First of all, your food's going to taste like smoke. Um, but again, you're not using your hands. Um, certain calls may have their own uh, potential for hazards, violent, um, violent calls. You need to make a plan. You need to have an area of egress and always assume that there could be uh, malicious intent for somebody calling 911. Um, observe. So observe surroundings, observe people that are in the room, don't turn your back on, on people, and uh, be able to um, react, whether it is calling on the radio for help, um, whether it's backing out of the uh, out of the building quickly. So make sure you plan ahead, make sure you got that radio, make sure you um, know who you're gonna call, what you're gonna do if something goes south. Uh, body mechanics. Um, I lifted appropriately with a 400 pound patient, but my um, bone in my shoulder, I, have a, I had an avulsion fracture of the humeral head. So where the uh, tendon um, holds the humeral head, it actually like, like broke the bone. Um, so I lifted appropriately. I used my legs. I didn't use my back. Um, kept my back nice and straight, but holding the patient like this, and it actually um, broke the uh, top of my, my shoulder there. And it took me out of work for six months. So no, um, no, the object. We ended up calling to get more assistance. Know your limits. I know that I can't pick up a 400 pound patient by myself and communicate. You want to say, okay, lift on, on three, one, two, three, and everybody goes up or there's, um, lift after three, or let's go down the stairs. Um, let's go this way. Let's go that way. Okay. We're going to rotate on three. We're going to do head movements, all that kind of stuff. You gotta, you gotta communicate. Um, and it will really help your body mechanics and it will help the, the patient. You don't want to drop the patient. You don't want to move the patient when the other person helping you is not moving the patient. So protect them. Um, we've got emergent moves, which is you got to get them out of that situation now. Um, there's urgent moves, which is you do the bare minimum to make it as safe as you can to get them out. And then there's non-urgent, which is more of a take your time uh, you can get them out. That's putting the full kit on. Um, urgent is doing um, rapid extrication and emergency is you're grabbing them, you're going, um, starting CPR, getting them away from a vehicle that's on fire. Uh, medical legal. I talked about this for uh, a hot second. Um, consent. Uh, consent needs to be informed. Um, especially express consent. They can't consent to something if they don't know what they're getting into. So, um, hi, I'm Brianna with uh, such and such ambulance. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little history and some vitals on you. You're telling them, but they can always say, "Oh no, I don't need that," and that would be refusal. Um, it is a lot better than than asking. Sometimes, sometimes you're like, "Can I take your blood pressure?" And they'll be like, "No." Well, and then you're kind of out of luck. But if you say, I'm going to take some vitals on you, is that okay? Or I'm going to take some vitals and you give them that opportunity to be like, nah, I don't need it. Um, you also need to tell them like, I'm going to start an IV on you. Um, it may hurt. I'm going to give you some meds. These medications might make you feel a little dizzy. It might make you feel nauseated. Um, I'm going to give you some nitro underneath your tongue. It may give you a pretty wicked headache. 
uh, it may make you feel um, a little drowsy, dizzy, lightheaded, um, just not feeling real good. These are the type of things you need to inform them before you give them the, the treatment. Implied, again, we go over if a normal person was in this kind of situation, what kind of help they want. A normal, like typical parent would want their child to have the, the, the medical care needed. So it's implied. Um, involuntary is where they don't have a say. They can't refuse, they're going. So you're looking at psychiatrics, um, you're looking at um, drugs um, and alcohol. Uh, if somebody tries to commit suicide, they do not have the right set of, of like mind to be able to care for themselves because they are not caring for themselves. So that's going to be your involuntary. With medical legal, you can get caught in uh, some legal situations where it actually can be a class B misdemeanor, depending on what it is. Um, but you need a duty to act. You need to actually have a duty to respond. If you're on shift, if you're on a scene, then you need to have a breach of that duty. Either you went too far or you didn't respond enough. There needs to be damages. If nothing happened, then there is no case. Something actually has to happen. There needs to be some sort of damage done. Um, and then you need to be seen as a proximate cause to that damage. The need to be able to link that. So there is a little bit of work involved to find somebody negligent, but it has happened and it can happen to you. So pay attention to what you're doing and cover your own butt. All right, anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the structure. Physiology is the function. Some uh, basic terms that a lot of people get confused on is proximal and distal. So proximal is in the proximity, anything towards uh, the torso. Distal is further away from the torso. The only thing that's different is your limbs. So, um, or no, that's right. So proximal and distal, so yeah. Gotcha. Anything, so this is um, proximal and then down here is distal. So towards the core, away from the core. Um, I was thinking like superior is up and inferior is down, but if your arms are up in the air, they're not superior. And when they're down, they're not inferior. And if you do this, then it's not superior and inferior. That's why we use proximal and distal. So I think distance. You got supine, which is your face up. There's a up in the word supine. There's prone, which is face down. You're faced on your belly. So prone has the word on. And then lateral, recumbent. Lateral is like on the side, your lat. Recumbent is that recovery position. So we have people that are gonna throw up and we wanna protect their airway. Um, Jimi Hendrix would have survived if somebody put him in the recovery position. A little bit more anatomy and physiology. Uh, your body basically has cells and then the cells all combine to make a tissue and the tissues all combine to make an organ. And then these organs combine to make a system. So cells include blood, it includes muscle cells, it includes um, nerve cells, all sorts of different cells. Uh, you do need to know Hint, hint for any testing involved, um, the difference between your um, hemoglobin, you need to know what the word erythrocyte means, uh, you need to know what the word thrombocytes means, and leukocytes. Um, so like if you think about it, like you've got cells that make up your liver, um, it makes up the different tissue, the actual layers of the tissue in the liver. Then those tissues all combine and it makes the organ. And the organ combine that with the, the stomach. You can you combine that with your um, like pancreas, the gallbladder. That's all part of your um, like GI system. Food goes into the stomach, it gets broken down. Um, 
it gets broken down more in your liver, your gallbladder breaks down fats, your pancreas um, excretes insulin to be able to break down the carbohydrates that you've consumed. So that becomes a system. Um, some more anatomy and physiology. If you look at your, um, your abdomen here, it's got stuff that's involved in digestion. It's got stuff involved in excretion. It's got stuff involved in breathing. And this is all underneath the ribs. This is just the abdominal quadrant. So when there's an injury there, it can affect bleeding. There's a lot of blood in the liver. It can um, affect potential for infection. Your intestines are full of poop and poop is bad um, to be on the inside. You want poop to leave the body eventually. Um, pancreas, if there's damage to that, it could, it could cause um, blood sugar issues. And if there's damage enough to the diaphragm, they can stop breathing. So there is a lot of different systems involved in just your abdominal cavity. Um, a and P, you're going to assess your patient. You need to know where certain body parts are, where assessment tools are. You need to know listening to lung sounds. You want to go, if you do right, you want to do left in the same side. You don't want to go right, 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 and then left, left, left. You want to do right, left, right, left, right, left, and then the back, right, left, right, left, like that. Um, with an unconscious unresponsive person, you need to check a pulse on the carotid or the femoral. It is gentle. You don't want to like squish it, but gentle and firm. I know it sounds weird. Uh, compression to the carotid. If you push too hard, you're going to close it off and not be able to feel a pulse. If you don't push hard enough, you're not going to feel it at all. Um, if they are responsive or conscious, you can check a radial. Your thumb goes in a radius, so your radial pulse is on your thumb side. Um, knowing the anatomy of, of those. Um, so remember, unconscious person, you're going to check a carotid. Unless it's a, a baby, then you're going to go with the, the brachial. Um, when you palpate, you need to know what structures you're feeling. The spinous process is in every single one of the vertebrae. It kind of sticks up. So when you're feeling that, you need to realize um, the shape of a, a normal pelvis. You need to, to understand the, the, the structure of the bones and know what a normal um, wrist feels like. You need to be able to determine if that um, grinding kind of movement is normal or not. Um, feeling an abdomen knowing which areas are supposed to be squishier and softer than others, or knowing where a fundus is on a pregnant woman. Um, auscultation, you need to determine the sounds on inspiration as well as expiration or exhalation. Part of the assessment is getting a good thorough history. So sample stands for signs and symptoms, which you're going to go over your OPQRST because that's all your symptoms. Then you've got ample, which is your allergies, medications or anything that they take recreationally, um, pertinent history, anything that has to do with the call or that may be affected by meds, allergies, or this call. I always ask any diabetes, respiratory history, or cardiac history. L is last oral intake. Really, it's last intake. It doesn't have to be oral. When was the last time you used your nicotine patch? When was the last time you shot up heroin? Um, when was the last time you smoked weed? What, when was the last time you did this or did that? It doesn't have to be oral intake. Really, oral intake is um, for ingestion poisoning or a diabetic emergency, issues like that. So it's just last intake and you can kind of guide it to the, the patient specific. And then of course, events leading up to what caused the incident? What brought them to calling us? OPQRST, you want to know the onset of their symptoms. Was it rapid? Was it um, prolonged? Did it take a long time? Was it slow or gradual? Um, does anything make it better? Um, so palliation, does anything make it worth, worse? 
provocation. So P is, uh, is provocation or palliation. When somebody is um, in like hospice, they're in palliative care because they are trying to make them feel, feel as best as they can. Um, so make them feel better. Q is quality. How would they describe it? Is it, is it burning? Is it pinching? Is it tearing? Um, have them describe it. And if they can't think of what it is, don't just say, oh, is it burning? No, like throw a bunch of them out there. Can you, can you describe this pain? Like, is it, is it burning? Is it pinching? Is it tearing? Is it stabbing? Is it dull or achy? Uh, that way they have a bunch of different things to go off of. Cause a lot of times people will just take whatever you give them and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's it. Um, radiation. Does it go anywhere with their, their breathing? Does it radiate to um, their like head? Do they feel dizzy? Do they feel nauseated? Does it affect their like stomach? Um, chest pain, does it go anywhere? Does it go up your neck? Does it go down your arm? Um, so radiate doesn't mean just cardiac. Radiate means does it affect other systems? Does it affect other parts of your body? Um, S, severity, is their evaluation of how bad this is. Um, so I always ask, um, like, how would you rate this? Like, the worst pain you've ever felt in your life is a 10. I could not make it worse if I, if I hit it, pinched it, pulled it, would be a 10. Um, zero being no pain whatsoever. How would you rate your pain? Because if I say it like that, then they can't give me a 14 because a 14 is not a number for the one through 10. Um, and then T is time. When did this start? How long ago? This is not the same thing as onset. Onset is gradual or rapid um, 15 minutes ago, but it came on suddenly or 15 hours ago and it came on suddenly and I've just been putting up with it for 15 hours. That's the difference between your onset and your time. Um, we will go over AEILU tips, which is actually kind of falling out of um, use, but we're gonna cover that later. Um, and then part of your assessment and history is getting vital signs. You need to get vital signs. Try to get a blood pressure manually before you start using the, the monitor. All right, you're gonna start with cardiology. So a little bit of anatomy um, refresher here. Coronary arteries are the arteries that are surrounding and feeding the heart itself. This is what's gonna be affected during a heart attack. If there is a, a block here, some sort of clot, everything downstream is going to be affected. So if you have, um, Let's say you eat too many cheeseburgers and there's a little clot right here. Um, everything, that was a horrible, there we go. I don't know why. So there's a clot here. Everything um, downstream from it is going to start dying. So this whole area of this muscle is going to start being starved of oxygen and they're going to start um, dying. This is why um it's important to to get um, information about uh, blood pressure because certain blood pressures will give us an idea of how the heart's being affected whether they've got like congestive heart failure they've got um more threatened or more threat to have um like significant uh, blood pressure problems. Um, if they've got like an inferior, so inferior being like below. So having an inferior infarct here, that would be very, very bad because that is our money maker of our blood flow. Um, the atria is the top two chambers. The ventricles are the bottom two chambers. Um, Arteries uh, leave the heart, veins return to the heart. Pulmonary artery is the only one that does not have 
oxygen and the pulmonary vein is the only vein that does have oxygen. The SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. That's the thing that uh, tells the heart when to beat. And the vena cavas, that comes into play um, with, at, at least at the M21 level, that's the biggest vein that returns to the heart, but that comes into play with pregnant women. And that's why we wanna put them on their left um, tilted to the left a little bit to get baby off of sitting on that vena cava. There we go. You guys need to know acute coronary syndrome. It is a blanket term. It does not mean heart attack. It does not mean um, angina. It means all of it. So it's included in there. Um, anything, because I cannot say that a person is having a heart attack. I can give the symptoms, I can look at the EKG, and I can assume they're having a heart attack, and I can call in an alert, but really they're having an acute, which is happening suddenly, that is not a, not a chronic thing, coronary being the, uh, the blood vessels that surround the heart, and syndrome, anytime you see syndrome, it basically means we don't know what causes it. We have to start rolling things in and out. So acute coronary syndrome, something happening to the heart vessels acutely. So we're looking at um, like a cardiac tamponade. We're looking at um, cardiac contusion. We're looking at an irregular heart rate. We're looking at um, angina. So you might get all these different symptoms, fatigue, um, heart rate changes, palpitations, nausea, dizziness is a huge one for heart. Um, you're not getting enough blood flow, then it'll start to affect your brain and you might start getting feelings of, of dizziness. Hint, hint on your test. Um, cardiac disorders, I kind of talked a little bit about those, myocardial infarction, myo meaning muscle, cardio meaning heart, and infarction is death or dying. Uh, coronary artery disease, this is what happens that could cause a heart attack. So the coronary artery is either getting full of gunk and nastiness or it's becoming um, damaged or stretched or hardened. Um, angina pectoris is um, basically a spasming or a squeezing of the blood vessels that causes um, chest pain because it is limiting blood flow. And it might not be, be because of a clot, but it might be a combination. Um, and usually these people will have nitro prescribed to them, even though they've never had a heart attack. And they go climb a few flights of stairs, their chest hurts, they sit down, and it is uh, it feels better after a little bit. So a lot of times angina does get better um, after the exertion. Uh, they're at high risk for having a heart attack because something's causing the limitation of oxygen. Um, heart failure, usually caused by a previous heart attack or like weakened or damaged muscle. It's not a per it's not pumping effectively. So you'll start getting backflow or back pressure of, of blood. It's not, it's not going where it needs to go. Uh, and then aneurysms down, down there at the other side, you see this like bubbling. Well, that bubble of that blood vessel can eventually pop. Um, the worst one is a AAA, which is your abdominal aortic aneurysm. So in the stomach, the aorta comes out and then wraps around and goes down. If that has an aneurysm, you will bleed out really quickly. Your aorta is about the size of your thumb. Um, and it, yeah, it's a massive artery and you will lose all of your blood in, in minutes. It is a really high fatality rate, even on the operating table. People will describe it as like a ripping or tearing feeling. Um, if, you, if you do palpate the stomach and you feel a pounding or a pulse, Take your hands off of it and get your butt to the hospital quickly. Definitely call this in as a, as a possible AAA. Um, biggest thing with cardiac is the recognition and assessment. Um, there on the picture, you can see some jugular venous distension. You'll get this with a back pressure or a back flow um, 
heart is not pumping effectively and things are getting backed up. Things are not filling up where they need to be. Um, you need to recognize signs and symptoms, dizziness, uh, chest pain, uh, radiation to their arms or their fingers, checking a set of vitals. Um, vitals are huge when it comes to medications that we're going to give. And you're going to see that with nitro. Um, get a history. Were they running? Were they jumping? Do they have um, a history of, of heart failure, of cardiac disease, and pedal edema? Do they have a backflow or a backup of fluid? So it could be backed up in their feet because gravity works um, and blood goes where gravity takes it. Or do they have a backflow that is going into their jugular vein? Do they have a backflow in their lungs? Is, your, is their lungs filling up with fluid? Um, with treatment, we want to give them oxygen as needed. We try to keep their their oxygenation. We don't want it at 100%. We actually want it 90, 96, 95, 97. Those are all great numbers. Um, aspirin, if you're allowed to give aspirin per your, your protocols, um, then you will give aspirin. It helps with the thrombocytes and making them more slick and less likely to um, attach to one another and make that, that clot worse. Um, it's not a bleeding agent. It doesn't make people bleed, but it helps prevent additional clotting. And then nitro, you have to, have to, have to ask about ED drugs. You need to ask about drugs that could cause a significant loss of blood pressure and erectile dysfunction meds. You've got your Viagra, um, Levitra, Rivatio and Cialis. And Cialis, um, it could be up to 48 hours that you can't give nitro because they've taken Cialis. Um, and you need to take vitals. You will decrease their blood pressure because it is a vasodilator. You want to dilate the coronary vessels to allow blood flow around that clot to feed that heart. So right here, these, if there's a block, say where the partial block, if you open up the blood vessels using nitro, more blood can get by that, that clot or that block. That's the whole point of giving nitroglycerin. It's not to reduce blood pressure. It's not to um, uh, give them a wicked headache, which is one of the side effects. The whole point of it is to dilate the coronary arteries. Um, if their cardiac problem is bad enough, you need to do CPR, uh, proper CPR. Improper CPR is the leading cause of failed resuscitation. People not knowing how to do appropriate CPR. They're not going hard enough. They're not going fast enough. They don't have the correct ratio down. As adults, um, we don't need as much oxygen as little kids. A lot of times it's the alcohol, cheeseburgers, and lack of exercise that has caused damage to our heart over time. Um, and kids, most of the time, they go into cardiac arrest because of a respiratory problem. Something happened with their airway um, or the ability to breathe. And they, uh, they actually cause the heart to stop because of that. So compression ratio. 30 and two across the board if you were by yourself. You wanna do 15 and two if you and a partner are on a child. Um, that three to one is for newborn resuscitation and it is literally like one, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. Um, you wanna stop the vehicle because it's dangerous. If you're gonna do CPR in the back of the vehicle, the back of the ambulance, pull over, you and your partner will will start running the code in the back of the ambulance. There's no point in transporting a dead body. Um, the hospital doesn't want a dead body and you're more likely to get the person back if you work together. Make sure you tell people on the radio that you're, you lost pulse and that you're gonna stop on the side of the road. Tell them basically where you're at and that you need some help. You can always um, have additional people show up, troopers, police officers, um, uh, another medic unit, but it's a lot safer, especially when you're dealing with electricity and the AED 
to not be rolling around in the back of the rig. Um, we want to maintain the airway. You want to keep that, that head um, in the neutral position as best as you can, especially when you're doing compressions, because every time you do press, it kind of expels any air that was in the lungs. And when you let go, air does go into the lungs a little bit. And that's going to help um, do ventilation. And then with a the proper airway, you're going to have less likely of, of air getting into the stomach and causing um, vomit to come up. So protect the airway even during compressions. All right, we are now in uh, respiratory emergencies, respiratory patients. Um, adequate uh, versus inadequate. You can see here adequate, the rate 12 to 20, um, 18 to 30 for kids, they're gonna breathe faster. Infants, they're gonna breathe like hummingbirds. Um, rhythm is usually regular, just breathe in, breathe out. Um, you should have breath sounds. Um, chest expansion, it needs to kind of fill the lungs most of the way, not completely. And just give you a look there. If you see any of these, this will tell you that you need to do something about it. If they're not breathing adequately, you need to fix it. Um, is it a problem with their rate? That means that it needs to be fixed with something that fixes rate, your BVM. Um, is it um, noisy? It's got wheezes. We need to fix that with albuterol. Maybe it's closing off because of a an allergy and they have anaphylaxis. We need to fix it with epi. So adequate breathing, don't usually have to do anything with it. Inadequate, we need to step in and, and uh, take over or fix something. Um, adequate, no mental changes, no signs of distress. Um, sometimes you can give them nasal cannula or a non rebreather mask. Uh, depending on what their SVO2 is, maybe they've got some sort of uh, congested heart failure or something, but they're having adequate respirations. So monitor the SVO2 level and their uh, mental status. Inadequate, they may have mental changes. They may exhibit signs of distress. You may have to take over their uh, respiratory rate. You may have to give them CPAP to be able to clear out some of the fluid at the base of their lungs. You guys can't do CPAP unless you are given um, permission by your uh, service. Uh, you're going to monitor SPA2 just like um, adequate, but really monitor the way that your patient looks. So mentation, um, stress or distress, um, and all those like the rate, depth, and lung sounds. Different respiratory diseases. COPD is a blanket term for um, something that's chronic, something that's obstructive, that deals with the, the lungs, and it's a disease. We've got emphysema and chronic bronchitis. So chronic bronchitis is basically a bunch of nasty, phlegmy, grossness in their mucus plugs. Um, and then emphysema is just damage to the little air balloons themselves. So they've been dried out, years and years and years of smoking um, have, have, smoke is dry, that's why we smoke, so we smoke food, that's why jerky um, is so delicious and amazing. Um, smoked salmon kind of dries things out. So years of smoking actually go into the alveoli in the lungs and dry, dry them out. They're no longer able to, to open and close um, like you, you can see there in the picture. Asthma is um, inflammation of the, the airways. And that's why they call it like a whistling sound with wheezing. When you whistle, you make a tightening of your, of your upper airway. And with asthma, things will swell and create a tightening. And so you'll get these musical little whistly sounds in the lower airways. With the chronic bronchitis, you got that mucusy grossness. So you're going to hear loud mucusy grossness type sounds. Um, pulmonary edema. Edema is like an accumulation of fluid, pulmonary being lungs. This could be from drowning. This could be from a cardiac problem that causes a backflow of fluid into the lungs. 
respiratory treatment, we kind of covered this a little bit. Um, assess, 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 assess. Assess their mentation, the adequacy of their, their rate, their rhythm, their depth. Um, check the SpO2. Um, give oxygen as needed. Albuterol, you're going to give metered dose inhaler to the patients if it's prescribed to them, to them, to the patient. Epinephrine is going to be with uh, an auto injector and it's going to be the patient's own auto injector. There are no contraindications to epinephrine during true anaphylaxis. Uh, they will die unless they are given epi. So you don't have to jump right into like getting vitals and stuff. You need to recognize an airway and breathing problem and get the epi gone. Um, albuterol, same thing with how um, quickly and um, extreme some people's asthma is. Um, you hear wheezes and they're prescribed an albuterol. A lot of times that albuterol will, will help clear up those wheezes. They both work in a sense they, they open up, they dilate um, the, the bronchioles. Um, but with anaphylaxis, a lot of times, well, what it is, is it's anaphylactic shock. Um, and shock, they need to have their, their blood vessels um, reconstricted because they've actually expanded, they've lost consciousness. So epi works in two ways. It opens up the bronchioles and allows more oxygen in, and it constricts or tightens up the blood vessels, which increases blood pressure and gets more blood flowing to the brain and um, reoxygenates the brain so they can um, be conscious. Oh, I'm gonna pause here for a second. I need to get some water, hold on. Come on. All right, we're gonna cover soft tissue. Uh, yeah. Okay. We're going to cover soft, soft tissue, multiple, multiple, uh, muscular skeletal. We're going to cover chest and abdominal trauma, head and spine trauma, bleeding and shock, and then uh, DCAP, BTLS will kind of be covered throughout um, this whole thing. Soft tissue, closed wound versus open wound. So closed being not open. Open being there's bleeding or a, um, a hole into the body. Um, so closed wounds there, it could be a hole in the inside of the body. Um, it could be bleeding on the inside. So we're looking at internal lacerations or punctures so broken rib, then punctures the lung, um, body part gets crushed, but there's no exterior bleeding, um, laceration to the liver or a rupture of the spleen. Um, those would be all closed injuries. Um, open injuries is going to be abrasions, lacerations, penetrations, and punctures. An avulsion is basically a flap caused by a, by a large laceration. Um, amputation is a very, very deep all the way through, all the way around um, laceration that uh, actually makes the body part move uh, away from the rest of the body. Um, bite wounds are basically small lacerations caused by teeth uh, or uh, punctures caused by teeth. Um, and then blast injuries can cause um, damage to the body with like shrapnel. And uh, those are different forms of uh, open wounds. So you can see the pictures there. Some of them are smooth. Some of them have jagged edges. Um, and then you can see damage to the tissue and tendon from a uh, chainsaw injury. That is wicked awesome. Uh, burns, um, they're determined by their agent and their source. So thermal, chemical burn, electrical burn, could be um, like a sunburn, could be radiological, like nuclear radiation burns. They're also um, described by their, their depth. So superficial, which used to be called um, first degree, partial thickness or your second degree, and third degree is your full thickness. Um, that's going to be your like depth. Um, severity is like how, how much of it. So we're looking at what it is, how deep is it, and how much does it cover the actual body. 
Um, so rule of nines is going to like review your rule of nines. You might be asked to determine what percentage is burned and they'll give you like the front of the thigh, um, the entire circumferential of um, the lower leg. So the tip fib area, your calf and your, and your shin. Maybe it's um, just the chest that's burned and like the face, those type things um, to determine the percentage of um, burn. There we go. Um, trauma to the muscular skeletal. It really breaks down to the axial skeleton and then the appendicular skeleton. So axial being um, the head and the spine, um, basically the, the core uh, of the body. This is where your, your nervous system is, your brain is encompassed inside your skull. There's different fractures and involvement with, with brain and skull injuries. Scalp, scalp injuries bleed a shit ton. Oh, pardon my French. Bleed a crap ton. Um, you don't want to use direct pressure on um, open head injuries because you don't want to be like pushing down on brain matter. Um, they bleed a lot, but they're, they're usually not like a significant arterial bleed. They're more of a venous or capillary bleed. They just bleed a lot. Um, so you want to, to put gauze in the wound and then wrap like you would a normal, normal bandage. Um, anything in the axial skeleton, you pretty much aren't going to do tourniquets. Um, it's really for the the limbs, so the appendicular skeleton, your arms and your legs. Muscular skeletal, you need to know head, neck, and spine. I like to use um, breakfast at seven, lunch at 12, dinner at five, and then remember that the sacrum and the coccyx are fused, but there's actually five and four. Um, with spinal injuries, it is a high risk. Always assume with every vehicle accident, pedestrian versus vehicle, motorcycle, sport injuries, always assume there is a high, high, high risk of um, spinal involvement, um, spinal compromise. It's not common though. Most of the time, people have no spinal injuries, but always assume it's always a high risk. Um, anytime you find somebody that is unresponsive um, in the water and near water, always assume that there is a, a head injury or a neck injury. Um, anybody that gets electrocuted by well, lightning or, or other electricity, assume that there is a spinal injury because we don't know if they were, they were thrown a distance from the electrical impulse. We're also going to treat them for for burns and we're gonna treat them for um, cardiac compromise because our body is full of electrical systems. Our nervous system is full of electricity. And then you shock it with a million volts, then uh, there's gonna be some sort of compromise. Um, helmet, if it is a football helmet and football pads, it's all or nothing. You're gonna remove the helmet, you need to remove the shoulder pads as well. If you don't know how, talk to the, the sports trainer um, that's on the field. They're going to know how to take the, the helmet off the best way. Um, you have to take the helmet off to take the, the shoulder pads off. So you might as well take them both off anyways. Um, with other helmets, as long as it doesn't affect your ability to assess the airway, um, you can leave, leave helmets on. Um, so... This is where we get into more of the DCAT VTLS. So we talked a little bit about um, um, abrasions and lacerations and punctures, but there's also deformity. So DCAP, your deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. So muscular skeletal assessment, you're also gonna look for pain, deformity. So anything that is out of the normal. So. Um, anything that is bent or moved out of alignment. Um, grading is crepitus. It's like putting um, dice in a Ziploc baggie full of jello and then like, rolling them around. They kind of bang on each other and grind against each other. Um, that's going to be your crepitus. And if you feel crepitus, that means there's a bunch of loose bones in what you're assessing. Swelling 
is a, uh, an accumulation of fluid. It's the body's way to start healing and to get a lot of nutrients um, down to the injury. Bruising or contusion is broken blood vessels underneath the skin. So that's our, our closed um, injury. Um, exposed bone ends. Bone ends, if they are moved, can lacerate um, uh, blood vessels and nerves. Uh, so that's where that nerve and blood vessel compromises. Expo exposed bone ends can also um, uh, get, um, what am I trying to say here? Um, besides being lacerated there, you want to be, you don't want to push them in, but once you align the leg, a lot of times the bones kind of go back in, into place. If you give a little bit of manual traction, you do not give manual traction to joints. Um, you try to um, care for the joint kind of as the position uh, is and allow a doctor to um, assess. We do want to try to straighten things, make a leg look like a leg, but we do not want to pull traction on joints. Our joints are not made to have that kind of pressure. Our bones can handle it because we stand on our bones. They're stronger. Um, they take a lot more weight. The joints are meant to just basically bend um, and kind of support between the two bones. They're not meant to be pulled apart. Uh, chest and abdomen. Um, always assume that there's going to be a disruption in breathing, whether it's lungs or your diaphragm, always assume that there's going to be some um, disruption. Hemorrhage and shock. You have a lot going on in your chest. Yes, it's protected a little bit by ribs, but there is huge risk of heart involvement and lung involvement in your chest. It's pretty much all that's there. Um, let's see, so rib fracture, you can have a flail chest, which is going to have multiple rib um, fractures. You can see sometimes like paradoxal motion where the rest of the rib cage goes up, but the broken area goes down and then vice versa. As the ribs go down, that area goes up. Pneumothorax, pneumo meaning like lung or air in the chest. So not in the lungs, but it's actually in the chest cavity. Um, there's cardiac tamponade, which is like fluid surrounding the heart, um, and then aortic dissection. We can have somebody that's in a significant car accident and it basically rips open the um, aorta and they can bleed out. Pneumothorax versus tension pneumo and then a hemoneumo. You need to know, or a hemothorax, you need to know the difference. And when they say in a test, you have somebody with no lung sounds on the right side and um, noticeable JVD, you know that there is a back pressure of fluid. That lung, so that picture there, that lung is being compressed, bunch of air in the lung or outside the lung. So you can't get lung sounds on that side. You don't hear any lung sounds because the lung is teeny tiny and being crushed. It's gonna start moving and putting pressure on the heart. The heart's not gonna be able to pump. That back, that pump is getting squished. So blood is getting backed up. It's gonna back up into your um, venous system and JVD is gonna be present. It's going to cause jugular venous distension. Now, if you have a hemothorax, imagine all of that in that picture is actually blood. Every time your heart pumps, it's filling that um, area more. So there's not really a back pressure. Blood is moving, blood is filling that up. Um, so you can start, um, you can get a hemothorax as well. So blood in the chest cavity. You can have somebody with a hemoneumo. So they have air and blood in the chest cavity. Um, these you have to recognize and you need to get somebody there that is trained and you need to haul butt to the hospital. This is an immediate life threat to have a pneumothorax. Tension pneumo is just a really bad pneumothorax where they start being compromised. Um, pneumothorax treatment, um, if it is an open pneumo, you're going to uh, cover with an occlusive dressing so air can't get in. Um, we tried to do like a burping or um, three out of the four sides are sealed. So air can't go in, but air can escape if the pressure starts to uh, increase. 
Um, if you give CPAP, it can actually worsen a pneumothorax uh, because you're, you could be putting more pressure into the chest cavity instead of the lung. Um, occlusive dressing doesn't have to be a manufactured. It could be saran wrap and some tape. It could be a gloved hand until you can get somebody that can bring you some saran wrap and tape. It doesn't have to be fancy. Uh, bleeding and shock. There's internal bleeding and external bleeding. Um, we are concerned about perfusion. We want the brain to be fed with oxygen and nutrients. Uh, we also want waste removed from the body. Um, and then there's different um, levels of shock and different causes of, of shock. So you can see here kind of a refresher there on um, the heart. So there's that vena cav uh, cava. That's what we're worried about with um, pregnant women. Um, your arteries, so you can see the pulmonary artery doesn't have oxygen and the pulmonary vein does. Those are the only um, veins and arteries that are opposite from the rest. Um, your aorta comes out and then goes into the abdominal aorta, goes into the, the femoral artery and then down to the, the rest of the tissues. Um, it's a good uh, picture there. Um, arterial bleed is going to be uh, squirting blood. It'd be bright red in color. Um, venous, it could be dark red in color because it doesn't have all that oxygen. And then capillary blood flow is going to be slow. This is what we test for blood sugars. All right, bleeding and shock. There are causes of um, bleeding and shock. It's a disruption in perfusion of either the brain or organ tissue. It can be from volume loss. Maybe you're dehydrated. Maybe you have bled out. So there's something wrong with the volume itself. There's pump failure. So congestive heart failure where the actual heart is not pumping well enough. So things start to back up. You're going to see pedal edema. You're going to see JVD. Uh, blood vessel tone. You jump off of a building and you have spinal shock because you land on your feet and it shocks your spine. Your, your body, um, in response to that, just kind of um, vasodilates and all your blood pressure, all, yeah, all your blood pressure drops to nothing because your blood vessels are all massive opened. Um, or it could be an obstruction of blood flow. So a clot. You've been riding in an airplane for hours and hours. Um, and you've had your knees bent and a clot goes in and gets stuck in your, your leg and the rest of your body starts to, to get constricted down there. So it could be a perfusion problem or uh, that could cause a perfusion problem. You could have um, a clot in your lungs. You could have a clot in your heart and cause a heart attack. <clears throat> So shock treatment, we want to get it when, when they're at compensation. Their body's able to compensate. Um, they lose blood, we stop the blood loss, and they're able to eventually make more blood. That's what our bones are there for, um, as well as um, using it for muscles and standing, but they make, uh, they make more blood. Decompensation means that the body's not able to recuperate itself. It actually is going to take some sort of intervention. So we come in, we can give fluid, we can keep them warm, um, we can keep them oxygenated. This is where you're going to treat for shock. Irre irreversible shock will lead to death. They need to see a surgeon, they need to have blood products given, their body is not able to recuperate, our simple treatments is not going to be enough. They are going to die unless they get to a surgeon and have some drastic changes done. Um, basically, we want to prevent acidosis, hypothermia, um, and coagulopathy. We don't want things to clot. When blood sits, it clots. Um, when the body gets cold, it's less likely to um, be able to recuperate. We don't want um, lack of oxygen. When you don't breathe enough, you don't have enough oxygen, you start to build up um, carbon um, dioxide, and it's very acidic. And we are pretty much in one teeny tiny area between acid and um, base. So we don't want to become acidic. Um, you actually can die from acidosis. You can die from hypothermia. 
And with all these different clots, you're not able to feed the body because the blood is being clotted and pooled, but it's also gonna cause um, blockage for normal flow. <clears throat> All right, lifespan and special circumstances. We're gonna cover some OB, we're gonna cover a little bit of peds and geriatrics. So there are some physiologic changes in pregnancy. There's also some um, uh, actual like, like uh, mental changes that happen. Um, people that are not ready for motherhood, they actually start developing um, a lot of like different mental changes. Some will have nightmares about losing the child. Um, they'll have different feelings and understanding of like, they've had conversations with their baby, even if their baby isn't born yet. So um, being aware that uh, you might have to do a little bit of like, just listening to, to the mom. She's gonna know where the baby is. She's gonna know a lot about what's happening with that baby. Um, the, ba the mother is feeding and oxygenating and providing everything for this um, this fetus. So oxygen demand starts to increase. Um, the, the rate increases because it needs that she needs to breathe more. Consumption is, um, is required. That means everything else needs to, to increase. So the blood flow has to increase. Plus there's a, there's a baby in there. So more blood flow, more oxygen, everything has to go in there. Renal blood flow increases. This kind of goes why, um, one of the reasons why um, pregnant women will have to urinate a lot more. Um, we'll go back to that. Um, especially another one is um, the baby's in there and it pushes on the bladder. So mom will have to pee a lot more. So we've got blood volume increasing, renal blood flow increases and pressure on the bladder. Mom's gonna, gonna pee a lot more. Mom also gets morning sickness. Mom also gets... Um, Weight gain, um, which is hard on the on the rest of the body, hard on the feet. A lot of different um, pressure changes. <clears throat> oh, next week. Um, some issues that we may have. Most of the time, women have been having baby for millennia. Um, there are some issues that happen with pregnancy. Um, an ectopic pregnancy is a an emergency. Um, this is something that needs to be taken care of at a clinic or hospital. Um, it's where the uh, egg gets implanted outside of uh, the uterus itself. Uh, placenta previa, you can see the picture there, there's going to be some severe bleeding, but it's really not painful. It's just the placenta is grown in an awkward spot. Um, you've got the abrupto placenta, which is that middle one. Um, it's where uh, there's a hole, you can see there were uterine bleeding at the top, kind of where the, the baby butt is. Um, there could be a hole, so it could be very painful, but there may not be significant amount of bleeding depending on where it is or where the baby's head is. Um, the ruptured uterus is very painful and massive bleeding and the baby could uh, be terminated, the baby could die. So all of these are significant um, scary moments for, for, for EMS, as well as uh, uh, health and safety of the, of the baby. Stages of labor, um, dilation, so all the way until full dilation of the cervix, then the delivery of the baby is the second stage, and then waiting for the placenta to be delivered is the third. You want to, don't push the head back in and don't keep the legs closed, but you do want to um, prevent the head from completely exploding out of the, out of the vagina. Um, if you have to tear the amniotic sac, it's something that you, that you need to do. Most of the time it, it ruptures and that's how they get um, their water breaks. Um, look for the umbilical cord. And if there is, you need to put your fingers to where the cord goes in between them and you're able to, to keep the head off of the cord. Only suction the airway if there's meconium and um, stuff in the airway. We don't suction the airway anymore uh, unless uh, they are required. Um, deliver the anterior and then the posterior um, 
support the baby's body with both hands as it's delivered. You're going to dry them off. You're going to clamp the cord and um, use scissors or scalp to cut it. And then you need to do an apgar scar at one minute and then five minutes. <clears throat> Limb impre um, presentation, um, you need to start rushing this baby to the hospital for an emergent, possible emergency C-section, um, especially there with like a, a leg. It's really bad if it's a leg and an arm. Um, they may be able to kind of rotate themselves back to a position, but that that one on the on the right there, where it's a leg position, that is that is a scary scary moment there. So they need to go get a C-section. Um, APGAR is appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respirations. So what's their overall appearance? Are they moving? Um, what's their pulse rate? Uh, we're looking for everything above 100. Are they mad and angry at you? Because they should be a little grumpy faced. You just took them out of a nice warm bubble bath. Not bubble. Warm body bath. I don't know. Whatever. Um, activity. We want them kind of uh, crying and moving around and then respirations. Um, so seven to 10 points, these are all scored from zero, zero, one, two. So bad is zero, okay is one, and two is awesome. So seven to 10, basically just keep them warm, check their blood sugar and uh, give them to mom. Four to six, we need to keep them active, keep them mad at you and give them some oxygen. Zero to three, we need to give oxygen. You might have to bag them and provide compressions. <clears throat> Neonates is that first month of life. They are like hummingbirds. That heart rate is gonna be just rocking and rolling and they're gonna breathe quickly. The first year that they're alive, they're an infant. You can see how it's still really fast, but it is slowing down on their respirations and pulse. Um, they do belly breathe. Um, their ribs are not developed um, as much, and they use a lot of their muscles in their belly to breathe because, again, the ribs are not as, as developed there. Um, noticeable characteristics at nine months, they're able to um, kind of sit themselves up. Um, their heads are really big, so you want to make sure that you pad their shoulders to align their their head because they do have like alien heads. And um, an infant, because their their heart rate's a lot faster, they normally have a um, a little bit higher temperature than a preschool age. <clears throat> Fontanelles, that's where your um, cranial bones have not fused together, and there's usually like a like a soft spot. Don't don't poke the soft spot. Um, if it is um, sunken in, they're probably dehydrated. If it's bulging out, there could be an infection or, or an overhydration. Toddlers are your brats. I mean, the um, tots, the terrible tots, uh, a little bit slower heart rate, but still a lot faster than adults. Then your preschoolers, your three to six, typically don't really understand sarcasm yet. Then you get into your older brats. 6 to 12, they start to understand some sarcasm. Um, they, they want a lot more independence. They want to be able to do uh, things on their own, uh, go places, a lot more accidents on like bicycles and skateboarding and those type of uh, injuries. They're getting a lot closer to the adult um, ranges for heart rate and breathing. It is a lot slower, but still faster than adults. Um, blood pressure is starting to get into um, a little bit higher ranges, and they're just growing like weeds. Um, tweens and teenagers, they're going to have um, the same vinyls as, as adults, essentially. And their blood pressure should be on the low end of what, what adults have. So we're starting to see that 90 um, systolic is our magic number for for shock for uh, adult range. Early adults, that's where I fit in, at least for another five years. Uh, 60 to 100 beats a minute, 12 to 20 breaths per minute, and then uh, systolic blood pressure, 90 to 140. Middle adults, um, they start having 
uh, empty nest, children are starting to, to grow up and move out. So you might have a little bit of depression there. Uh, they start having vision and hearing loss. They might start having some cardiac problems, start having more comorbidities. Um, late adults uh, really depends on the health that they had as early and middle adults um, on whether they're going to have a lot of medications, but things start to just progress more and more. They uh, start having family loss, their spouse, their loved ones, um, their parents have, have died, their siblings are dying, all of their friends, nobody's left from school or work. Um, so there's a, it's a big depression area here. They're left in, in homes, um, they're ignored, they're neglected. So late adults, they, there's a high potential for, for suicide in uh, this age bracket. Um, life expectancy is getting longer. Well, it was, it was getting longer um, until recently. Um, our life expectancy on average is actually decreasing because of um, the opiate um, epidemic. But for the most part, we're not living at 34 years old um, and, and dying by by 34, 35 of old age. So we are getting um, better with our medicine and better um, healthcare in general. Geriatrics in general, we start to get um, hardening and clots in our arteries. Um, that's why you're more likely to see heart attacks in the older generation. Um, the, the older you get, the more chances you'll have of uh, diseases, either cardiac problems, dietary problems like diabetes, um, respiratory problems, emphysema, COPD. So they may have medications that may, will affect our treatment or signs and symptoms. We have somebody that should have a high heart rate. Maybe they're um, in a car accident and they're, they're bleeding and they should have an increase of a heart rate to compensate. But in, instead, they've taken their, their blood pressure medication and it decreases their heart rate. So what their body wants to do is increase, but they're actually being blocked by their blood pressure med. Hearing and vision loss, don't assume that everybody that's old needs to be yelled at because they can't hear. Some of them can hear just fine and some of them have hearing aids. Um, you can use some sort of physical contact sometimes um, if needed to assist in communications for those that have hearing and vision loss. General rules, um, the younger the person, the faster the pulse and respirations. Usually the blood pressure correspondence corresponds to the patient's weight. Um, so it's um, typically increases with, with age. So up to about 140 systolic. Terminal drop hypothesis. Um, theory that the person's mental function declines in the last five years of life. So grandpa had a, a change in mental function and within the next five years, he's probably going to die. That's the, that's the theory. Um, neglect, high potential for abuse in children and the elderly, um, especially children under five um, and twins, uh, special needs children, and then elderly, they're neglected. They're left in a home. Um, they're ignored. They fall in the kitchen. They haven't been seen for several days. They've been sitting in their own feces and urine. So high potential for abuse in children under five, twins, um, and special needs. And then again, in the elder, elderly stages. <clears throat> uh, last section here, medical. We're going to cover some altered mental, includes diabetes, seizures, um, drug use, behavioral, and um, infection. I don't know if I, yeah. Anyways, um, altered mental, going over our AVPU, that's the first thing. Well, our first thing is, is the scene safe? Somebody that's um, not acting appropriately can be really dangerous. Diabetics can be really dangerous. They can be violent. Um, people overdosing on, on drugs, when you wake them up, they can be incredibly violent. Um, belligerent drunks. Uh, so make sure that the scene is safe. What if they are um, being poisoned? You don't want to walk into a house that has toxin in the air or they're trying to kill themselves by using um, like detergent and 
chemicals in a locked car and you open the door and you end up getting poisoned. So make sure that your scene is safe. AEIOU tips, it's kind of falling out of use, but I love to use it still um, because we've all been taught AEIOU and it's a good tip. So alcohol, epilepsy, insulin, um, oxygen, any of these will cause some sort of altered mental. So you find somebody that's not acting right. Is there drugs or alcohol on board? Do they have a, a history of epilepsy or is there a seizure? Are they a diabetic? Is there a problem with their oxygenation? Maybe they're having um, an allergic reaction or an asthma attack. Um, do they have like a like urinary tract infection or kidney infection? Is there poison on board? Is it CO poisoning and they've lost consciousness? Um, do they have sepsis? Do, are they having a psychotic breakdown? Or is there blood loss and they're in shock? So these are, and there's so many different ones. So many other people use different A's and E's and I's and all of that. Um, <sighs> diabetes. Um, glucose requires insulin to be able to move into the cell. The glucose cell is huge and it can't get through the door without the insulin. Think of it like a key that unlocks the door and then the glucose can get in. Uh, there's type one and there's type two for the diabetes uh, mellitus. There's also like gestational diabetes, which is typical with pregnant, not typical with pregnant women, but it only happens with um, pregnancy. So that's why it's called gestational. Um, type one also used to be called juvenile diabetes, but people were confused because it's usually young adults. Um, think of it like um, their, their pancreas has an autoimmune disorder. Their body is no longer able to make or use insulin um, because they're, they're, they, they lack the um, response for it. Their body has attacked itself enough to where it doesn't make insulin anymore. Type two is more like the body has been bombarded with so much sugar over the years that it's sick and tired of it and it doesn't want to deal with it anymore. And the insulin it does make is not enough because it's been overused and abused. It's a little exaggerating, but it's the best way to remember like your type one and your type two. Um, hypoglycemia um, is low blood sugar, typically below 50 milligrams per deciliter. Um, depends on your service protocols. Um, hyperglycemia is typically above 140 milligrams per deciliter. Um, a good number to, to go off of is 100. Um, when, like 120 over 80 is like the magic blood pressure. We'll think of uh, blood sugar as the same thing. 120 high, 80 low. That's average for a non-diabetic. Now people can have symptoms and have a normal blood sugar, at least for us normal, but they've been high for so long that a blood, sh a blood sugar of 80 is actually low for them. So don't take the glucometer like, like hundred percent, like always have that in your mind. If the shoe fits, if this, if the story is checking out, this person has a significant history of diabetes. Um, they haven't eaten for two days. Um, they're, they're showing the symptoms unconscious, unresponsive, and you don't have a glucometer. I would treat them for, for, um, hypoglycemia. You don't need a you don't need a glucometer to treat. If they have a really really high blood sugar and you give them a, um, a little bit of sugar, they already have a really high blood sugar. Um, Twenty milligrams is not going to make a huge difference. If they have a very low blood sugar and you give them sugar, you'll save their life. So if you are seeing the signs of a diabetic problem, you can give sugar. You don't have to have a glucometer to give sugar. Um, hypoglycemia versus hype, hypo versus hyper. Um, hypo is usually rapid onset. Um, they haven't eaten, they've had um, a stomach bug and they've been throwing everything up. 
Um, it usually has um, tachycardia because your body's trying to um, get sugar around as fast as it can, um, even if there's no sugar there. Usually some sort of um, pale diaphoretic. They'll have a diabetic seizure. Hyperglycemia, on the other hand, very slow. It takes time to build up all of that sugar. Um, they're, they don't have enough insulin, so sugar cells are just kind of sugar molecules are just floating around waiting for keys to open up doors. Um, so everything's starting to get dried out, like sugar dries things out. So they're thirsty. They want to dilute. And so they keep drinking and drinking and drinking. And the sugar's not going in the cells. Um, it's just hanging out on the outside of the shell, the cell. So their body is starving for sugar. Go figure. It wants sugar, but it can't use the sugar. So people are going to eat, eat, eat. They're going to drink, 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 and eat, eat, eat. And that's going to cause them to pee, pee, pee. Um, so increased thirst, increased hunger, and increased urination. And even all that drinking, they're going to get dehydrated because it's going to dry them out. <clears throat> Medical seizures. Seizure is basically an interruption or um, irregularity of the electrical activity of the brain. Um, you can have a partial seizure. It could be um, just um, like half of the body, just um, arm and leg on one side, be an absent seizure where they basically just stare off into space. Partial seizure, you can also get like slapping of lips or just like blinking of eyes, just certain body parts. Um, generalized, uh, we call it the tonic clonic because most of the time they have tonic, which is rigid and stiff. Hint, hint, you need to know these. Um, and clonic, which is the jerking movements. So you can have just a tonic seizure and a clonic seizure, or you can have a tonic clonic seizure. After the seizure stops, there's usually a post ictal um, uh, pause. Um, they may start waking up, they'll be confused or drowsy, maybe they're sore. Um, if they don't completely regain consciousness and they go back into a seizure, um, or their seizure lasts um, five minutes, they're in status epilepticus. Status just means um, like unending. Um, you want to protect the patient. You want to remove any clothing that is restricting possible airway. You want to um, clear a room. You do not want to hold them down. You can actually rip muscles and break bones if you hold them down. Let them seize. You can put oxygen on. So when they are making jerky movements, they're getting some oxygen because you can see there in the symptoms of tonic, they may stop breathing because things become stiff and clonic, they may start foaming at the mouth or drool. So you want to get suction ready. Do not put anything in their mouth. Um, do not put your fingers in their mouth. They could bite down. They'll bite their tongue. They might bite their tongue off, but they'll definitely bite you if you put your finger in their mouth. <clears throat> a CVA or a stroke is kind of like a brain attack, like a heart attack, but for the brain. It could be caused by a blockage or an ischemic stroke. It could be from a bleed or a hemorrhagic stroke. Um, since we don't know which one's which, they're having stroke-like symptoms, you do not want to give aspirin because if you think it's a block and it ends up being a bleed, you'll just make them bleed more. A transient ischemic attack. Um, so transient being like comes and goes, ischemic is like uh, that block and then attack is while well, being attacked. So it's a block that kind of comes and goes. It's basically a precursor, like a, I'm gonna block, oh, just kidding, not yet. Your time is not yet. Um, Remember to assess with fast, that's face, um, arms, speech, and time. So face, are they having droopiness of the face? Are they able to smile? Can they show you all their teeth? Um, arms, put, put their arms, palms up, eyes closed. Do, does one of them sway to the side? Do they lose the ability to hold both of their arms up? Speech, are they able to um, repeat a phrase? Are they able to answer questions without slurring um, or appropriate words? And then time, this is twofold. You need to um, get them to a hospital in a very rapid time, but you also need to know when was the last time they were seen normal? We don't know when the stroke happened, but we can determine when it didn't happen. So if you saw them at 6 p.m. and now it's 8 a.m. the next day, it could have happened any time. It could have happened at 6.05. 
but we know that it didn't happen at 5.30 because they were seen normal at six. So when was the last time they were seen normal? Um, you want to transport them on the affected side. So say my right side, I'm not able to use it. I can't keep my arm up. I'm not able to walk. That means that the, the right side of my ribs, the right side of my body is um, unable to function appropriately. If you put all of, um, all of my weight on the side that does work, it's going to be having to lift up more because um, it's got all that dead weight on it. So you want to put the undamaged. You want to think of it like opposite of trauma. You break your femur, you want all the weight on the good leg. But you break, you um, have a stroke and your right side's not being used, put the weight on the right side. It's not that it's injured. It's just that it's not working. So you might as well allow the side that is working to, to continue work um, working. Poisonings and toxins. Um, it's not just like products that you know are poisonous. Anything can be um, toxic if used in excess. You can have too much water. You can have too much oxygen. Um, scene safety is huge. Key, key, key. You want to get a thorough history. You want to know what it is they've been exposed to. You want to know how they were exposed. You want to know how much, how long ago. Um, and you need to remove them from the source of the toxin. If they're being poisoned by something, stop that. Stop the poisoning from happening. Take them out of a smoky room. Um, get the needle out of their arm. Get the, um, the powder off of their body. Get the um, liquid that's been burning them off of their body. <clears throat> you can basically have poisons ingested, inhaled, absorbed through the eye or the skin or other mucous membranes or injected into the body. Uh, poisoning continued. We've got opiates. You got to remember the opiate triad. Opiates will slow respirations down, man. Um, you will be in this um, so it triggers the, the fight, or fight and flight response, but in the opposite. So that rest and digest. So you don't want a whole lot of light. Your, your pupils are going to get nice and small. They don't want a whole lot of light. Your respirations are going to get super slow. And you're going to go to sleep. They don't have a, a low heart rate typically. It doesn't really have an effect on the heart. What people die from is the fact that they stop breathing. So uh, an opiate overdose, you're gonna see the triad. So the slow respirations, the pinpoint pupils, and the sleepiness or unconsciousness. Uh, carbon monoxide, this is the most common inhaled poisoning. Um, I, see, I put band around the head because that is the most common way people describe the headache that they get. Um, it's really common for people to have nausea, um, some headaches, some dizziness. Those are the typical symptoms with carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, if they are in a structure fire, um, not only are you worried about burns, but you're really worried about um, carbon monoxide poisoning as well. Um, alcohol, this is a, a big safety concern with alcoholics um, and belligerent alcoholics. You don't want to um, be involved in that kind of um, violent behavior. Uh, be aware of DTs. So an alcoholic can um, go into delirium tremens, which they can end up actually having a seizure and dying. Um, they can have auditory and visual hallucinations, which can spark into a lot of violent behavior. So scene safety, when in doubt, uh, call the poison control center or call your medical direction on, on what to do. The solution to pollution, pollution is dilution. So they have a respiratory problem. They have too much carbon monoxide, give them oxygen. Get rid of the carbon monoxide in their lungs and fill it with oxygen. Um, at the ALS uh, level, we can dilute, if there's anything in their, their bloodstream, we can dilute it out with fluid. Um, you can rinse out eyes if there is um, a toxin in their eye. You can um, if directed by poison control or by a doctor, you can give milk. Do not give it on your own. Make sure that you have it as directed. 
um, you can, if you can't dilute it, you can try to remove it or inactivate it. Um, act activated charcoal, you do have to call to see if um, you're out able to get this. What it does is it um, basically envelopes around the toxin that was ingested and it does have a laxative in it and it pushes it out of the body. Um, the children's one does not have a laxative because children are susceptible to dehydration. So the adult one will have a laxative and the child one will not. Um, Narcan, um, you can, if, you're, if your standing orders allow or you're directed to, Narcan actually fights for the same receptors that opiates do. And so it'll go in and block the opiates from um, being activated or used. Um, so that can be given in many different ways, IV, IM, in the nose, um, many, many different ways. Narcan is really easy to use. Um, they, they give it in, in clinics to drug users. So you might, might see police using it. You might see other um, like bystanders having it. Um, make sure that you're uh, allowed to give it per your protocols. <coughs> Medical treatment for all of these. So your diabetic, your your stroke, your seizures, your poisoning and overdose. Um, you want to assume that there's some sort of airway breathing circulation concern. Um, you also want to rule out any possible causes. So AEIOU tips is alcohol. Do you smell alcohol? Get a get a history. Maybe they've been drinking and driving and there was an accident. So you're dealing with trauma and medical. Um, do they have a seizure disorder? Um, is it a small child and their temperature increased rapidly and they had a febrile seizure? Um, do they have a history of diabetes? Can you check a blood sugar? Do they have um, like no movement on the right side of their body? Are they not able to smile, but they were able to smile two hours ago? Um, if you can get a glucose, um, if you can't, you can always give sugar. If you think it's a diabetic, they fit the mold, they fit the history, they fit the signs and symptoms. Um, it happened over the last few hours. He started going unconscious. He does have a history of diabetes. You can't check a blood sugar. I would still give um, a tube of the glucose. They have to be able to swallow and protect their airway. Um, oxygenation, some of it, like CO poisoning, you need to be able to, to dilute it. Um, Narcan, if the, the shoe fits, if they have that opiate triad. Um, so be, be prepared to treat the, the signs and symptoms, treat um, what, you, what you can't. So go back to the respiratory. So your albuterol and epinephrine, back to your, your nitroglycin with your cardiac. Um, treat the, the signs and symptoms and try to, to reverse some of these if you can. All right, testing tips. Study beforehand. Um, watch all the other videos, watch this video, read through your, your books, read through any notes you may have taken. Um, try not to study minutes before the test or even hours before the test, because sometimes you'll start to jumble up things or um, kind of overthink some of the questions. So study beforehand, try to take a moment for yourself before the test. Make sure you get enough sleep, uh, make sure that you, you rest, um, make sure you relax, get uh, some, some hard pieces of candy. See if when you take the test, you can have some lifesavers or some those Werther's butterscotch thingies or whatever those things are called. Those things are so good. What is that? So good. Toffee. There you go. Werther's toffee. Mm, delicious. <sighs> Questions. Read the entire question all the way through question and then answer, 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 answer. Read all of the answers because you're like, if you read to B and you're like, hey, B is totally it, but D was a better answer, then you've gotten that one wrong. So make sure you, what I like to do is I will read the entire question. I will answer it in my head what I think the answer would be. I read all the answers. And if any of them match what I thought, I'm going with it. Uh, don't rush. You have a time limit, but most of the time, those time limits are way longer than you actually need. So take your time, don't overthink, but make sure you uh, 
um, pay attention to keywords. You have a heart patient and it talks about um, no bleeding, no GI bleeds, no recent surgeries. It's probably going to be asking about aspirin or it says you have a, a chest pain heart patient and they have not taken any um, ED drugs and their blood pressure is 130 systolic, it's probably gonna ask you about nitro. So those are the things you need to pay attention to, those key things. Um, it talks about wheezing, maybe some albuterol. Um, talks about um, difficulty breathing and unconscious, probably gonna have to do a BVM. Um, just pay attention to those key things. Um, read the question. The answer that comes to mind is probably the one that's going to be in the selection of A, B, C, or D. So um, good luck. I have total confidence um, in, in you guys. I want you to, um, I want you to do well on, on this test and you guys will do well. well. You, can watch all the videos on the YouTube channel. Um, you can text me or email me uh, with any questions and I have total confidence in you guys. You guys uh, will, will do great. Uh, let me know if you have any other questions and have a good night.